presence we find our strength over everything our redemption god with us you are god with us you are here you are holy we are standing in your glory you are here This morning, as we are preparing our hearts to uh, celebrate the birth of Christ, and uh, today I'm going to begin a series of a series of messages that begin with creation and follow this thread from the beginning of the Bible on how God had always planned to send the Savior. And we read prophecies like this here in Isaiah 9:6 that we say, "Yeah, this definitely speaks of uh, the Messiah," but we're going to learn today that God planned it from the beginning. Listen to God's word this morning here in Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will, will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judge, judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Father, we give you thanks and praise for the promise of the coming Savior. And we celebrate, we know who he is, Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth. And we praise you and thank you for our Savior. Prepare our hearts, O oh God, to worship him we need you jesus to be in this place right now in our hearts and in our minds we want to focus on him and our need for him and we pray your blessing upon this worship time as we come to you this morning to worship you i pray in jesus name amen why don't we take a quick moment and just go around and greet one another and welcome each other to calvary baptist Michaela, Joanne wants you. Good morning. I went down one. You went down one? Okay. My precious child. Good morning, Rach. Morning, Rach. Where's Father? Hey, happy birthday. Happy birthday. I don't remember. No. Well, well, so we were playing at Jackson before. before. Oh. Same thing he always does. You weren't fun, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, I, I went down two, so I'm playing you three. So I'm going on eight. talking 
to somebody. You know how that goes. Yeah. our time together in his word. Father, you are so good to us. Thank you, Father, for your mercy and your grace. We find and we see in Jesus who suffered and died for our sin. And Lord, as we come together this morning, we ask that you would prepare our hearts to receive your word, that you would open our eyes our ears and our hearts uh, to receive the word of God, the truth of thy word, that uh, we would receive it with gladness. I thank you, dear Lord, for this gathering. I thank you for this time of worship. And may you be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Please have a seat.
How's everybody doing this morning? Just a couple of you are here. I hope you're all doing well. You'd never disappoint. I tell you, a little while ago, I was looking out, and I didn't. I was like, wow, we're going to have like five people, six people for worship, and then uh, the gang from downstairs comes up, and then the rest of you folks, you get here, and uh, it's always good to have more eyeballs staring at you when you're preaching, amen? So it's good to see you all. Well, I invite you to open up your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1. Interestingly, maybe you never thought of it this way, but uh, we're going to learn a lot today about uh, this grand plan that God has given to us from Genesis all the way to Revelation. We're not going to look at all those today, just so you know, but there's a grand theme in the Scriptures, begins in Genesis chapter 1 and 2 of this story of the Redeemer. And so we're going to look at Genesis 1 and 2, some verses out of there uh, this morning, and I believe that uh, God's going to bless us. And then uh, as we continue this series of messages, it's all meant to help prepare us uh, for our celebration of the birth of Christ. So for the next three Sundays, I'm going to demonstrate from the Scriptures the story of redemption that begins in Genesis and how the Bible unfolds it's this grand narrative called by some to be the drama of scriptures the story of the redeemer now, did you know that the bible which is a big book and has many books that make up this whole that this big book that we have they all relate there they are not separate books that don't relate to each other, that don't relate to the whole, but they're all connected to this grand narrative of God's story of a Redeemer that He's promised to send. Uh, do you know that all the Scriptures point to this Redeemer? From Genesis all the way to Revelation, you can follow this grand narrative of God's story of a Redeemer. And I believe it's important for all of us to know that. Because today we live, the life that we live today, many people that we know that we might work with, maybe even in our own, own home, don't relate to God maybe that way we did or maybe we, the way we were raised. Years ago, you would never have to explain creation. You would never have to explain who God is. But today, when you talk about God, the person you're talking to most likely does not understand the same thing that you're talking about. Things have changed. People do not live their life with God being at center of their life. If there is a God, the God of the Bible is most likely mocked. And there are probably many reasons for that. But people don't see how their life fits into the God of the Scriptures. That could be true of some Christians some Christians uh, do not understand the, the Old Testament Scriptures and how it relates to the New Testament of the Scriptures. And so we are tend, we're prone to just go to the New Testament, and some of that is my fault to some extent because I tend to feel more comfortable preaching in the New Testament. But all of the Scriptures point to Jesus. Have you ever thought about how the dietary laws, how, how the exodus out of Egypt, God brought him out of Egypt, and how all the different various stories of, of David and Daniel, and how all these stories of the Old Testament, how they all fit into God's plan. Or is there one central theme in the Scriptures, or all is, it, is this just all put together and no rhyme and reason to it? Now, some people look at the Bible that way, and I would believe even some Christians look at the Bible that way. Maybe that's perhaps... Why we don't read it from time to time is because we don't see how it all fits together. Well, I believe it's important, especially uh, to this world that we ought to be witnessing to. We ought to need to understand how these scriptures all come together. I read this story of a Christian who had a Jewish friend who taught the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, at a local synagogue. 
And one day, the Christian and this Jewish person were having fellowship. And the Christian was over this Jewish person's house, and, and the Christian picked up a commentary that the Jewish person used to teach at the synagogue. And the, Jew, the Christian person was thumbing through this commentary. And at, at, after he finished thumbing through it, the Jewish person asked him, well, what do you think? What do you think? And the Christian said, well, it's, 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 a bit of, it's a bit like hearing a joke without a punchline. It's missing the main point of the Torah, which is Jesus Christ. The Jewish person was taken back by this, but the Jewish person also knew that Christians believe that Jesus was the Messiah. So the Jewish person said, do you believe that all the Bible points to Jesus? Do you really believe that? And that's a great question to ask yourself. I'll ask you that this morning as you sit here. Do you believe that all the scriptures point to Jesus? I hope you do. I hope you see the Bible that way. Not only do they point to Jesus, but it's the Bible is this story, this grand narrative, this drama. It all points to God and His plan to send a Redeemer for a people for himself, and it's all about Jesus. In fact, Jesus even says that. Listen to these scriptures of Jesus from the mouth of Christ saying the exact thing that I'm saying to you. In John chapter 5, verse 39 through 40, Jesus says to the religious people at that time, those who did not believe in him, listen to his words. He says, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. These are they, these very scriptures that you are studying and that you are reading. They testify of me. But then he says, but you're not willing to come to me that you may have eternal life. Later on in the Bible, we see in Luke chapter 24, after the resurrection of Christ, as Jesus is appearing to his disciples and revealing to them who he is, on the road here, he's talking to some disciples. He says to them in Luke 24, verses 25 to 27, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in, listen, all that the prophets have spoken, ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory and beginning, this is what Jesus is doing, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets. And by the way, do you know what Moses he's talking about? He's talking about the first five books of the Bible. And in beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Later on, in that same chapter, verses 44 through 48, to the same crowd, he says to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and the Psalms. All Old Testament scriptures concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Then he said to them, verse 46, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And he says, you are witnesses of these things. So Jesus is explaining to them that all scriptures are about who? About him. They are about him. What is written in the scriptures testify about Jesus, that Christ would suffer and rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sins would be preached in his name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. So Jesus is saying it's not just some of the scriptures, meaning a few messianic prophecies here and there, but the whole Bible from beginning to end are about Jesus. So what does that mean? So that means that when you and I are reading the Bible, we need to be consciously thinking about the implications that, of what we're reading 
as Jesus says, and ask ourselves, how can I make sense of what I am reading in light of what Jesus' words say here, that these scriptures are about me? And I would say, as Christians, we need to read the Old Testament with a view as to how this particular story fits with the whole grand narrative of God's plan to send a Savior. So we can say this today, that we need Christ. We need Christ to understand the Bible, and we need the Old Testament to understand who Christ is. These two go hand in hand, and they cannot be divorced from each other. And so... This morning we've been, we begin, I'm excuse me, in creation, Genesis 1 and 2. But I just want to give you um, this grand narrative in one big whole and just name them for you so you can see what I'm talking about. Um, scholars come at this at different angles, but this is the, what I think is the best way of looking at it. There are six events or six really important people or, or, or events that happen in the Bible that bring, give this whole story of the Redeemer. They are as follows. The creation, which we'll look at today. The fall of mankind in Genesis chapter 3. Israel. As you begin to read the scriptures and you see Israel, when I speak of Israel, I'm talking about Abraham which would be the beginning of Israel, right? And then from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then that whole story of Israel and how that all came about. But when we look at Israel, we also have to think about the kings, and in particular, David, as this unfolds, this grand narrative. And then it goes, not only from there, it goes right into fulfillment of Jesus coming on the scene. And so we'll look at those three. For Christmas, we'll look at Jesus, of course. And then the church, how the church is a fulfillment and the church is a a, a representative of who Christ was when he was walking on the earth. And then from there, it goes to the restoration of all things. You know what that does? It's kind of like a circle. It begins with creation and how perfect and beautiful creation is and God's intention with creation. And it goes all the way to the restoration of all things and brings us back to creation the way things ought to be. That's God's grand narrative of all of, of the Redeemer coming into the world and how all of it fits together. So this morning we talk about creation. We talk about what it reveals about God and His original desire for the world. And so if you look at Genesis chapter 1 and 2, if you've ever read them before, they are a far cry to the way things are today, but they show us something. They show us who God is is and what his plans are for mankind. Uh, They reveal to us the way things should be, the way things ought to be, and the way God designed creation, and the way that we ought to be living on the earth. It is the beginning of the redemption story. And so look at your Bible here, and the story begins. It begins with who? It begins with God. The redemption story begins with God. God. It says, in the beginning, God. And if you just start right there with those four words, in the beginning, God, this is how the story begins. And this is how the story must begin. It it begins this way because this is the truth. To, To say that life began any other way would be a lie. It begins with the truth. Life began because of God. Life began because of God. There is no life without God creating. And I hope as you sit here this morning that you don't wrestle with that in any way, that you believe that God created all things. That you believe as the Scriptures talk about creation in Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2, and Genesis chapter 3, that you believe this story that is in the very beginning of our Bible. And that it all has to do with Jesus somehow. That's what we're going to learn. Listen to this. This is the truth. If Genesis chapter 1 through 3 doesn't tell us the truth, why should you believe the rest of the Bible? Ever think about that? If Genesis chapter 1 through 3 do not tell us the truth, then why should we read or believe the rest of the Bible? 
without a right understanding of our origin and how things began. There's no way to rightfully or truthfully understand our spiritual existence and where we go from here. We cannot know our purpose, and we certainly cannot know our destiny. After all, if God is not the creator, then maybe he's not the redeemer after all. That's why it's important. If we cannot believe the opening chapters of Scripture, how can we be certain of anything the Bible says? It's important. This is the truth. It begins with in the beginning, God. It begins with God. And this is the way life should be, with God at the beginning, with God at the center of our lives and God at the end of our lives. Because meaning and purpose will never, ever be understood unless you begin this way. Meaning will always be empty and void of significance and purpose without God being at the center. I would argue that we can only make sense of our life today only if we look back at the way things were in the beginning. And so the question is, what can we learn about God from creation? What can we learn? Well, the words there in the beginning, God, tell us a lot about God. Tells us a lot about the way things are. In the beginning reveals to us that everything in life and everything that we see with our eyes had a beginning. There was a time when nothing existed but God Almighty. Everything had a be beginning. Everything entered into time and then everything will one day cease to exist. Everything we see with our eyes. But the words in the beginning also tell us something else. It tells us something about God. You see, the story begins with God already there. God is already there in the beginning of things being created. He is eternal. He was already there. The story begins with God already being there. You see, God is the cause of everything we know. God is the uncaused cause of everything that had a beginning. God doesn't have a birthday. He had no beginning and he'll have no end. We learn further from this text here that in the beginning, God, the word God is, is the Hebrew word Elohim. It is used in Genesis chapter 1 and 2 to reveal that God is the creator, the provider, and the sustainer of all things. Israel, to which these scriptures were originally written to, lived in a polyistic uh, community where people worshiped many gods, many gods. And so the God of Israel is the only true God. And so Moses is writing these scriptures to the nation of Israel to let them realize that their God is the one true God. There is no other God but him. He is the one who created all things. And without him, nothing would be here. Not only that, but he is the only one that can give creation what it needs to survive. He's the only one that can give creation anything or all that it needs to be sustained. He is our God. As you read in Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 2, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the earth. Now, I had a I, for years, I had to teach you guys how to say that word, by the way. I don't know if you caught that. You didn't catch it? Uh, the Spirit of God was hovering. I mean, when I first got here, everybody used to always say hoovering. You remember that? You don't remember those days? Oh, it's so funny. You, you guys used to always say hoovering, and I had to correct you. It's, it's hovering. That's an inside joke. About five people got that. But in these scriptures here, these opening words of Genesis, they not only tell us that God is eternal, but that he created the heavens and the earth. You notice that there's no explanation whatsoever. It's just that God created out of nothing the heavens and the earth. In other words, God did not create the heavens and the earth with some kind of material that already existed. Nothing was there but God himself. And God creates things. Because he doesn't have to go to Home Depot to get parts and material. He just can speak things into existence. But as you read further in this story, the word of God makes clear to us that the world that God created 
in the beginning, over and over again, God uses this phrase regarding the creation as he looks at what he's made. What does he say? Over and over again, six times, God saw that what he made, and it was what? It was good. It was good. In verse 10, verse 12, verse 18, verse 21, 25, and 31, over and over again, God is saying that what he made was good. Nothing is wrong. So out of something that was, as it says there in Genesis chapter 2, formless and empty or void, God created something that was good. It was good. It was meaningful. It was beautiful. It was perfectly made by a perfect God who created the heavens and the earth into something that had order and had beauty. God created all this. If you look at this, a natural reading of Genesis chapter 1 and 2 revealed to us that God created all of this in six literal days. A natural reading reveals that to us. It uses a phrase in our scriptures that says, it says, and after God created it, look at verse 5, he called the light day and the darkness he called night, so the evening and morning were the first day. That phrase is repeated over and over again after each day that God created something. The e- it, was, it was morning and then there was evening. So a natural reading of this creation account leads us to believe that these are real 24-hour period days of God creating it. Evening, there was morning and there was evening. And so I would have to go outside the Bible to read into this story any kind of theory, any kind of theory regarding the time that it took to create. MacArthur says for us, these chapters that we're looking at this morning are often are too often mishandled by people whose real aim is not to understand what the text actually teaches, but to adjust it to some scientific theory. And he says that this approach is wrong. And he says this, which I think is wise. Since creation cannot be observed or uh, replicated in a laboratory, science is not a trustworthy place to seek answers about the origin and the fall of humanity. Ultimately, the only reliable source of truth about our origin is what has been revealed by the Creator Himself. In other words, if God doesn't reveal to us how things began and how it all got here, you and I would be clueless. No theory is going to help us, but God does reveal to us. And the words of Scripture are important. Every single word of Scripture is important. And so the phrases and those words reveal to us how God did everything that He did. And so this means that the biblical text should be our starting place. Not to look outside the Scriptures and try to figure out what this means. And so we come to it with that understanding, at least we do here at, on the pastoral staff and Calvary Baptist does. You might have your different belief on that. But in the first day, first six days, the first three of those six, God created different environments from what was formless. Then, listen to this, in the second three days, He creates inhabitants that correspond to those environments. So think about this. The first three days, God creates the, the light the darkness, he, he separates that. He gives us day and night, and then he creates the sky. And then he creates the land and the trees and all the, all the things that would grow from the ground. He creates all those things the first three days. And then the second three days, God is going to fill all that he created in those last three days. He creates the birds of the air, the fish, fishes of the sea, the animals that will be on the earth, and then he saves for last. The last day of creation, the sixth day of creation, is some form of a climax coming toward the end that everything he's made so far has been waiting for something, the creation of humanity. It would be like if you were expecting a child. I know when our first kid came along, along, we were like going crazy trying to prepare the environment, the atmosphere, the room, and, and you know, learning as parents, you know, okay, we got to make sure we have no lead paint, right? I used to eat lead paint for dessert. I didn't know why it was a big deal, 
right? But, but now you can't do that. And so we got to make sure there was no lead paint in the room. And, and, and it's nice and beautiful and bright for the children, for the child, I mean. And, uh, you know, you, you, then later on, you're going to have all these safety issues. And so you're preparing the atmosphere in the room. And that's what God is doing. He's preparing a perfect environment, a perfect atmosphere. He looks at everything he makes and he says it's what? Good. And he's preparing it for these two people that he's going to create. And so looking at this story, I want to continue reading in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28. We see the creation of the first two people, Adam and Eve. Well, let's listen to this. Uh, then God said, verse 26, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. My wife's not here, but I wish she was. She needs to hear this. Look what it is. God has given us, humanity, dominion over every creepy thing that creeps on the ground. Every insect, young ladies, you have dominion over every insect. Spiders, no matter what they are, they think they got a thousand legs. You have dominion over it. That's what God's Word says, amen? So no more fear, no more, no more yelling and calling for your husband to help you out here or one of your children. You have dominion. So, verse 27, God created man in his own image. Ladies, listen carefully. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So it's concluding both male and female have been created in the image of God with equal value, equal dignity, and worth. Now, obviously, thousands of messages we can preach from this, but we're focused on this theme. Verse 28, then, then, then God blessed them. Very important. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have, again, he's, he's, he's making this clear. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So this is telling us why God created humanity. I believe these verses tell us that God created us in His image. And now we can study that out in, in many messages of trying to understand countless of hours and time on this subject of what does it mean to be created in the image of God. But what if we just limit ourselves to this text? We will see that God created us in His image for two reasons. Number one, to share God's rule over creation. Twice he mentions that, that we're to have dominion. Let them rule. Let them have dominion. And so, therefore, listen, to be in God's image is to be like God in a sense that you are, you are God is operating His rule through the people that He has created and placed on this earth. We are created in His image. Nothing in all of creation is given that honor, is given that, that position to be created in the image of God. Nothing. The animals are not created in God's image. The angels are not created in the image of God. Only you and only I are created in the image of God. And so to be created in the image of God, image of God means to share, to share in God's rule over creation. Secondly, and this is important, to be created in the image of God is to have the ability to have a relationship, to have a relationship. God says that being created in His image means that we are able to have relationships. And this is why God said He created male and female, but it also reveals something about God. It says God is a triune God. Notice the words, let us make man in our image. And if you go back to the name of God, Elohim, in the Hebrew, that is plural, hinting to us that God is the Father, God is the Son, and God is the Holy Spirit. Now, this is not seen here in Genesis chapter 1, except if you go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, where it says the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the earth. It's hinting to us who God is, revealing to us that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, let us make man in our image. He could not be speaking to the angels at this point because the angels are not equal with God. Do you understand that? 
God is a triune God. But it also reveals to us something else about God that makes God different than any other religion out there. God is a relational God. God is a relational God. That even within the Trinity, there was a relationship. There was a fellowship. There was community. And he created us to not only have relationships with each other, but most importantly, God created us to have a relationship with him. God created humanity to know him and to enjoy him. This is why we are created in the image of God. So the story of redemption begins right here with that thought, right here in creation. God created life, a perfect life. And really, what made it perfect is not the things that we can enjoy, which they're great, but what makes the perfect life that God created is that God himself is what makes the creation perfect, that we can know him and enjoy him forever. Listen to me. This is what life is meant to be. This is why God created people, for us to know him and to enjoy him forever and ever and ever. This is the way it's supposed to be. And that is why the redemption story begins with creation because this is the way God has desired all of humanity to know this. And notice it says that God blessed them. He says, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. In these words, we learn that God created the earth to be inhabited by people who would worship him. And this command to multiply and fill the earth is really, really important because it's repeated later on. In Genesis chapter 6 all the way to chapter 9, you have the story of Noah. When After the flood, when Noah came out of the ark, God commanded them the same thing. He said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And so God gave that commandment to them. And so they began to do that. They left that area, but it didn't take long for that direct commandment to be disobeyed by those who gathered at the Tower of Babel. And instead of obeying God, the the opposite of the words are being used. They said, let us make a name for ourselves. Let us build a tower, lest we be scattered over the face of the earth. And so what did God do? God intervened, and he caused those people to spread out over the face of the earth by confusing their languages. This is a wonderful story. And why is God doing this? Well, God, God desires the earth to be filled with worshipers. God's intention for creation is that it will be filled with people to know him and to worship him. And if you go all the way to the end of the Bible, you see that God always wins, right? In Revelation chapter 4, it says there were some from every tribe, tongue, and nation around the throne of God worshiping him. Hallelujah. Amen. God wants to be worshipped, and he is only the one that's worthy of our worship. And then after God created everything, we are told, what did he do? In Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, he says that he rested. He says, then, thus the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work which God had created, male and female. In reality, that is the climax of the creation story right there, the rest of God. Uh, it's, it's a subject that we'll study in the future and get into deeper. It's very important, this rest. We know that God, it says even in Exodus chapter 20, the law that man should work six days and on the seventh day rest, right? It's like God is resting. We, don't, we know that God doesn't need to rest. God doesn't get tired. He doesn't get weary. And so this, this creation of this day of rest is important for you and I to get that rest. But, but what kind of rest is he talking about? What is the Sabbath rest? Is it just for us just to sit back and watch a football game? Well, it's part of it. I don't want to be in disobedience later on today at 4 o'clock when I'm watching the game, right? But that's not all of it is. It's, it's a rest is to rest so that we can worship God. It's cre- a day of rest. Notice, notice something, that it doesn't use the same phrase that it does for the other days that ended. It doesn't say that um, 
So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Then it's over, right? It doesn't use that phrase for the seventh day. It doesn't say that, that uh, um, so the evening and the morning were the seventh day. Why not? Well, that is because the seventh day of rest continues forever. It is a day without end. And the reason why is a day of rest that God created for you and I to worship him and to love him and to serve him and to enjoy him forever and ever and ever. It is a day of rest to worship the Lord thy God. Everything that you and I need to be satisfied and to live a meaningful and wonderful life. God created for us. God saw that what he had made was good. Not only good, but it was very good. This rest, this relationship with God is seen even more and in a more beautiful way as God, it says there in verse 8 and 9, that the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. Eden means delight. So if you want to know Beth Eden's name, it's Beth the house. Eden is house of delight. I married that. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life, which was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It even makes it bad grammar here, but makes it more perfecter. <laughs> it makes it more great. It's more beautiful. God places them in the Garden of Eden. This is a place of tranquility. It's a place where God himself will be with his people, kind of like the temple. This is the language of the temple. It's a beautiful language of God being with his people, takes up residence with his very presence with humanity for them to enjoy him forever and ever. Now, the last thing I want to point out in this creation story is that we see God's sovereign rule over creation, that God rules his creation through his word. God rules his creation through his word. In the beginning, God said, let there be light. And there was what? And there was light. God is ruling as the king over his kingdom. And when he has two people at this point, right? And he says, let there be light. And there was light. What is creation doing? Creation is obeying God's creative word. His power of his word, every time God spoke, creation obeyed. And now we're going to see God doing the same thing with Adam and Eve. And this is how God works in humanity. God rules sovereignly over all people through his word, just like he does here. Look at verse 15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat it. For in a day that you eat it, eat of it, you will surely die. It's God operating his sovereign rule, giving his word, saying, first of all, you may eat of every tree in the Garden of Eden. You're going to have a wonderful life. I've created all this for you, for you to enjoy. But there's one tree I do not want you to eat from. And he says, the day you eat from that tree, and here's the warning, you will die. Listen, death is not a part of this story. But it enters now into God's story as a warning. You will experience death if you don't trust my words. Every word, is, every word of God that proceeded out of his mouth should be trusted and obeyed. That's, the, that's what he's building this case right now. Trust my word. I, I rule through my good word. All of God's words are pure and good. Amen? And he's saying to them, do not eat from this one tree. And if you eat from this tree, you will surely die. Now, what does death mean? Death means separation. The moment Adam and Eve were to disobey that commandment, death would come into the world. They would be immediately spiritually separated from God. Separated. Secondly, their bodies would no longer live forever, but their soul and spirit, which is created in the image of God, would be separated from their body because of that disobedience. Sin would come into the world. And thirdly, because of that decision to disobey God, 
death would come into the world, the third part of separation is that they would be separated from God forever and ever in the lake of fire. And there is God's warning to Adam and Eve. Do not disobey me. All of this I've given to you is a good rule, a rule that will bring security, freedom, and, and a life. And God gave them, gave, God made them to express their commitment to him by obeying and trusting his words. God is ruling his creation through his words. And so, in this creation story that we looked at this morning, we see God's design and his intention is for humanity to know him and to enjoy him forever. I hope you see that. Secondly, we also see in this creation story the way things ought to be. And a way so that we can make better sense of the rest of the story and the way things will, will, will be in the restoration of all things. Because you and I know how the story goes. Adam and Eve did not listen to God. They disobeyed God. And then all kinds of corruption comes into the world because of their disobedience. I hope the story of creation paints the picture for you what God's desire is for your life. As you sit here this morning, don't feel like you're not part of this story. You are connected to this story because God has created you for a reason. As you sit here this morning, God desires for you to be totally satisfied and to be happy and to have peace and harmony in your life as it was in the Garden of Eden. And so I ask you this morning, I pray that you, that you long in your heart to know God, to worship Him and to joy, enjoy Him forever, for that is what God created you for. And you'll never, you will never be happy. You will never be totally satisfied until you are in that kind of relationship with God that you know Him, you love Him, and you are worshiping Him. For that is what God has designed you. Let us pray. Father, thank You for these words. Thank You for reminding us the way things ought to be. And what You have created us to know You, to enjoy You forever. We are created in your image. And we know, as we read the rest of the Bible, we see what has happened. We can make better sense of things, understanding how things ought to be. We can make better sense the way life is now. Why is it all messed up? Lord, help us to, in our hearts, to truly long for you, to want to worship you, to want to know you, and to want to enjoy you forever. Help us to look to your son, Jesus, who has come into this world to be the Savior. And as we end this time in gathering together to worship you around the table, the Lord's table, the Lord's supper, may it be a time of remembrance as your word says it ought to be, a time of true worship and reflection. May you reveal to us that which is hindering our relationship with you as a church corporately and as individual members. May you be truly worshiped. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. As we continue our worship time, we are going to now participate around the Lord's Supper, worship Him in re being, remembering what He's done for us on the cross of Calvary for our sins. And it's a wonderful time. We do it once a month. And um, I'm glad that you're here. Before we partake of the Lord's Supper, I'm going to ask that you find in your bulletin this little piece of paper here that is the covenant that we have, um, those who are members of Calvary Baptist, have uh, agreed to live as a family um, regarding this covenant. This is our covenant. So if you're not a member of Calvary Baptist, it's okay. You can still read through it and, and look at it and see, and see what we as members of Calvary Baptist have, have 